Welcome to Discover You, an inspiring podcast exploring cutting edge solutions to our everyday psychological challenges. We explore complex mental health issues and talk to professionals, experts, and renowned authorities at the forefront of transformative healing. Our mission is to educate and destigmatize and to ultimately view mental health as a proactive quest for optimized living and equilibrium rather than mere crisis intervention. Welcome to another episode of Discover You, our podcast exploring innovative and effective solutions to issues in mental and behavioral health. I'm J.D. Kalmanson, CEO of Montier Behavioral Health, a family of dynamic and comprehensive treatment centers in Southern California. I'm so honored and excited to introduce you to our wonderful guest today, Kathy Dory. Kathy is a licensed marriage and family therapist based in Toluca Lake, California, where she specializes in women's health with a focus on pregnancy and childbirth. Kathy is a member of Maternal Mental Health Now, Los Angeles County's Perinatal Mental Health Task Force. She has served on the board of Postpartum Support International and is the co-founder of the Motherhood Consortium, an inclusive community of professionals who provide care and nurturing for mothers, families, and their babies. Kathy's clinical experience spans 20 years both as a private practitioner and with several well-regarded mental health agencies throughout Southern California, where she serves diverse urban populations, providing psychotherapy for a broad range of clinical issues, including depression, anxiety, stress management, stress management, abuse, and trauma. Additionally, Kathy has been a contributing writer for several parenting publications. Welcome, Kathy. So happy to have you with us today. Thank you for taking the Glad time. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us about your important work in perinatal health. It's an area that needs to be talked about more, and I'm so glad to have the opportunity to benefit from your expertise in this area. How did you get involved with this type of, uh, you know, this type of behavioral health and providing therapy for this niche demographic? Well, it was personal. I, I had become a licensed therapist and was working as a therapist, and I had had a baby and two years later, I had two babies at the same time. Wow. And in having those pregnancies and those children so close together in time, um, it got me very interested in maternal mental health. And I started reading and looking and researching, and here we are. Wow. That's, so. that's amazing when you see how your life experiences impact your professional career and you utilize them to mm -hmm. you know, really make an impact. Briefly, if you can describe for our audience, what is the criteria for perinatal mood disorder? Meaning, how long does it last? What makes it recognizable or separate from regular depression and anxiety? Perinatal is considered the time frame from conception through childbirth. Mm -hmm. Postpartum time is the time from childbirth through the first year after a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So the first year of having a baby. Um, and the criteria is all of the symptoms of depression, a major depressive disorder, as we would find in the DSM, but it's considered to be during that time. So all of the symptoms you've had, you'd have for a major depressive episode, you would find a woman experiencing either during pregnancy or during that postpartum time. Very so. interesting. And does right. it have any sort of unique features and properties that would make it separate or distinct from regular depression and anxiety? It does in that it's that monumental transition time of her life. There's no other time in a woman's life particularly, and for men too, it, it, where she change, has so many changes going on. So all of the issues that may have been in her life prior to getting pregnant and having a baby become even more heightened. Issues with family, issues with health, issues with finances, issues with her partner and her marital situation, um, issues with her professional situation, right? Everything gets affected when a woman has a baby. Mm -hmm. And depending on how she adjusts to all of those shifts in her life, uh, it may create some feelings of depression or wow. anxiety. 
So it and exasperates everything that's going on. Every stress inducer gets exasperated with correct. somebody who has postpartum depression. Correct. And what? for some, it's just a monumental adjustment period. But for others, it can be a period of major depression. It can come with um, obsessive compulsive disorder being exacerbated if that was a pre existing condition that she had. If bipolar was a pre existing condition, that can be exacerbated as well. So there's a lot of things that can happen in a woman's brain um, during pregnancy and during her postpartum adjustment time that affect her emotionally and psychosocially too. In wow. All the interpersonal relationships in her life. What percentage of the population um, experience this? 10% of women experience depression or anxiety during pregnancy. And I want to emphasize depression. It usually we lean one way or the other. So some people, when they experience depression, lean more into the depression. Mm -hmm. Okay. And some are more, become more anxious. It kind of depends on the individual. Um, about 15% of women experience postpartum depression. So after the birth of the baby. So it's about one in eight. So there are in, in other words, if I'm, my math is correct, it would seem that everyone or almost everyone who experiences perinatal mood disorder would have that type of depression or symptoms extends postpartum, but not necessarily everybody who has postpartum did that begin at the perinatal stage. Correct. That's right on. Yeah. Not everybody is feeling symptoms of depression during pregnancy, um, but those who do tend to continue to have right. that experience postpartum. Right. Yeah. And is there a typical length of how long it lasts after postpartum? Postpartum depression can have an onset anywhere from the first few weeks after having a baby and can last until, you know, a year or two after having a baby. Wow. We, we, the DSM categorizes postpartum depression as having an onset in the first six weeks mm -hmm. following childbirth. Um, we kind of know that that's not really true. We know that women can be doing just great for the first six weeks and then all of a sudden um, comes out of nowhere. Set it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So when I mean, just before we move on from this, do you ever see outliers and, and cases where the postpartum depression can last years later, three, four years later? You do. It's kind of rare. Mm -hmm. um, but every once in a while, somebody's still in a very depressive state and they're two to almost three years in to having their child and they really haven't bonded well with their child. And um, there's a lot of detachment, a lot of lethargy, lack of motivation. Um, you do. I'm, our goal is hopefully to treat it. <laughs> That's right. That's Get right. people up and going and feeling better about their situation and um, bonding and with their babies. But yeah, you do see it later. So you mentioned bonding with the babies. What are some of the symptoms, the classic symptoms of perinatal mood disorder as well as postpartum depression? Well, the classic symptoms of perinatal mood disorder so, and postpartum depression specifically are all of the same symptoms you would find in depression along with a few extras. Mm -hmm. So, you know, low depressed mood, low appetite, um, inability to sleep, insomnia, um, the anhedonia, you know, can't really experience any pleasure and joy. Um, I would say a lot of women experience acute anxiety. Re when we say excessive worries, very excessive worries. If, especially if somebody has been kind of an overachiever or tends to lean toward um, OCD, obsessions, compulsions, wanting to obsessively protect their baby. Um, so that happens along with sometimes intrusive thoughts. 
So I, the, the idea that thoughts float in and out that I could harm myself or my baby could get harmed, most of the time, those are depressive symptoms. The obsessions that happen during postpartum depression are really focused on taking care of the baby, protecting the baby, and harm to the baby could happen, and I wouldn't be able to control it. Wow. So, I mean, the fact that a lot of these symptoms are really malnourishment for the body, whether it's insomnia or, you know, not being able to eat properly, that's going to cripple and paralyze the entire nervous system and make somebody extremely vulnerable um, yeah. to any type of right, any type of behavioral health or any type of real functionality, because this is somebody mm -hmm. who's uh, severely compromised. So go ahead. And would add to what you just said, you have to remember the hormonal shifts that are going on in a woman's body with the estrogen and progesterone dropping and also cortisol levels. So if you're not sleeping, we all know in the mental health world, if you're not sleeping and you have disrupted sleep, if you're up every two hours to feed a baby, your cortisol levels are going to be really high <laughs> and your adrenaline as well. That's right. right. And that's going to help that's going to contribute to impairing your ability to function and take care of this baby. And it's going to, to really affect your mood. So would you say that the primary causation to begin with for postpartum is these hormonal changes or is this one of the symptoms? I'd say it's a combination. It's a, it's a recipe. I think the hormonal shifts contribute to postpartum depression and depending on who a woman is, like I said, 15% of women experience postpartum depression, that same 15% of women experience other hormonal challenges in their reproductive life usually. Mm -hmm. So women who experience migraines, uh, cysts, ovarian cysts, endometriosis, other things like that sometimes are more at risk for postpartum depression. So they have, there's a biochemical component. Right. In addition to that, if the woman has a lot of life stressors that are very challenging, especially during the time of childbirth, that's going to contribute as well. Very, very interesting. So the life stressors are not necessarily, and tell, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, the way I'm perceiving this is that postpartum depression or the experience of, of women's health throughout pregnancy and then postpartum it has a, it, it takes a toll on the body and the nervous system. And so therefore, with that weakened nervous system, there would be a weakened resiliency and capacity to deal with major life stressors that otherwise, without this weakened nervous system, we might be able to respond to with uh, optimized functionality. It wouldn't necessarily cripple us and paralyze us. So it's almost like, yeah, so, so it's the, the strong life stressors are really highlighting the weakened nervous system and showing that this is, this is, this is what's going to happen when, when you have this type of stress going on as well. You look at the way we had babies a century, two centuries, years, millions of years ago. It wasn't the way we do it now. Mm -hmm. We had babies in community. We had babies in sports strong support systems, right? We, we had babies in a village yes. and we had the village there to help support the mother through the adjustment and support the baby and the whole family really. Yeah. We don't do that now. We have babies in isolation. Yes. But if you are a woman in our society now, and let's say, say you have a professional responsibilities, you are married um, and maybe there are stressors going in your marriage, things aren't going great, you don't feel very supportive, you have a baby and you have responsibilities in this relationship and to your job, you're going to not feel so good. That's right. You're going to feel very overwhelmed. For sure. And unsupported. And yeah, and that's even without the hormonal changes, that's let right. alone when you add that into the mix. Yeah, that's right. So as far as postpartum depression being a separate diagnosis, does the fact that we single it out and refer to it as a different type of depression? Is it really just describing the causation? But in actuality, from what I'm hearing, it's a classic standard type of depression and anxiety with the traditional symptoms 
and debilitating uh, you know, expressions that you would find in regular uh, depression anxiety. It's more just really ascribing the source and origin of the condition. Is that right? That, that's right. I mean, if, if, if you were to go to the American Psychiatric Association, they would say it's, it's major depressive episode during that time of a per woman's life. Yes. Right. But then we have to factor in the fact that it's not a typical depression depression because there are hormonal factors and extenuating circumstances to her adjustment to this transition of becoming a mother. Correct. And that's and that's really what I wanted to ask you next. I mean, we all know about baby blues, which can come about just lack of sleep, a fussy infant who's requiring constant attention. You mentioned getting up every two hours, the overwhelming nature of caring for a baby 24 seven is the how would you distinguish clinically um, just a regular situation of somebody who's overwhelmed as a parent and depression and postpartum depression? Well, uh, duration, intensity, frequency mm. is really what I would say. When, when we look at baby blues, it really is, uh, uh, some people might disagree with this, but that's more of what we would consider an adjustment disorder. If, mm -hmm. you're, if you're looking at the DSM and you're going to diagnose, have you ever had a new job and it was really hard to adjust to and you were challenged and maybe you felt pretty down some days at the beginning of that new job, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of how the adjustment to having a baby is for a woman who really may not be majorly depressed, but m might be having some hard days. It's the, the baby blues, right? It's an adjustment to something new and challenging. When you get into major depression, you're talking about another realm. The frequency of the feelings is more the intensity of the feelings is more and they last longer duration so i'm depressed all day every day i'm tearful every day all day i don't want to get out of bed i don't want to eat i don't want to sleep I'm, so it's 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 more it's just that much more wow and a lot of times when people have a baby and they're having what we call the baby blues they're in that adjustment time right and right no, that is so important. They they say the anecdote about a fellow who uh, he's in the Bahamas and he's really enjoying himself. And he sends a postcard to his therapist. He says, I'm having such a great time. I only wish you were here to tell me why. You know, so <laughs> not, not everything is is uh, is a diagnosis. Um, based on what you're describing, that this is really classic symptoms of depression. So the intervention and the way to treat this depression, would it be accurate to assume that it would be traditional interventions of treating depressive disorder? Yes, with the exception of, I, I don't think that it's emphasized as much that people need psychosocial support when they're depressed, as much as we emphasize it with postpartum depression. A woman with a baby home alone is probably going to be depressed a woman with a baby in a room full of other women with babies who may or may not be depressed will probably start to feel better mm -hmm. that, that does so why do you think that's the case um because when we normalize our experience we feel less alone right um i also think something i wanted to mention is mythology plays a big part of what, how a woman feels after she's had a baby and the myths around motherhood, childbirth and parenting contribute to um, how she feels. So she thinks she's going to go to the Bahamas to use your analogy mm -hmm. or wherever. Right. And have this glorious time. You're going to have a baby. It's going to be the best time of your life. You'll be so fulfilled. You'll fall in love instantly. Um, this will be the best thing that's ever happened to you. It will be life changing in such a wonderful way. You'll be glowing. I mean, on and on and on, right? We have all these myths. And if her experience doesn't match up to that, she's not going to feel so good. Right, right. If that makes so much sense. Her experience is I'm not sleeping. I'm, I'm alone in this. I don't, I, I'm, 
changing diapers and feeding round the clock and I get nothing back and I'm sitting here crying in the corner with no one to help me, she's, it's probably not going to be glorious. She That's so true. And then I'm just, as you're saying this, you know, the, the feeling of aloneness is so acutely felt because first of all, even her husband, even if their relationship is wonderful and he tries to be supportive, he did not go through what she went through. He is not the one who's feeding this baby. This baby is not dependent on him. She is the one who can literally not take off for more than two, three, four hours at a time. And that makes you feel really restricted. It feel, could feel choking. I mean, imagine if it's your first one. It's like you are a free person. And right now, you're, uh, you're on the clock, around the clock. Uh, there is no vacation from that. And then, you know, the rest of the people around you did not go through that traumatic experience. So there is a, there is a very strong aloneness, which gets counter, countered by being in a room with, uh, with people who had that same experience with you, mothers and children, and that feeling of support. And to go, to go back to your question about what's the difference between postpartum depression and irregular depression, the other things that play a part of this are your experience of childbirth and the experience you're having in the process of having a baby. If you go through a traumatic birth, something doesn't go quite right. That plays a major role in how you feel about yourself, your baby, um, if you can have PTSD after having a baby, mm -hmm. if there was a threat to your life or your body, and it was really terrifying, you don't necessarily want to hold your baby, this, this being that came out of you and, and harmed you. Um, and also it's just the, the fear of all of it. Right. Um, if you're not getting along with your partner, um, the partner relationship is and how it functions is essential to how a woman feels postpartum it's a major risk factor for postpartum depression if she doesn't have a supportive partner and um system of people to rely on very interesting would you say that amongst couples who aren't together postpartum or who are not in a healthy relationship, the susceptibility and likelihood of postpartum depression being, uh, being a fact, you know, t taking place, would you say the susceptibility is a lot higher? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Uh, it's funny because I've done a lot of research on, you know, the role that marital relationships and attachment between the adult partners, the marriage unit plays in um, postpartum depression and how it affects it. And if that relationship is not a good, healthy, strong one, it, things can go south really fast when a baby shows up. Wow. And, and I'm, I mean, is there any aspect of it that the mother looks at the baby and is just reminded of the partner who she's not happy with? Or yeah. The, yeah, is that, 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 yeah. that's a variable? Yeah. The other thing that can happen, and because you mentioned the father's experience, the father has his own experience of childbirth. And often we marginalize him, right? In our society, we focus just on the mother and the baby dyad. But if you think about it, poor guy, he's like out here on the sidelines. He's witness to this birth. It might be very scary for him. He's, these may be people he cares so deeply about him. I mean, he loves this woman and he's having a child and he doesn't get acknowledged much. And then also once a baby comes into the relationship, right. it's no longer a dyad, it's triad. And there can be lots of feelings that the father may have. Um, he may feel marginalized. Mm -hmm. He may feel envious of his baby, that his wife is giving all this attention to the new baby. Um, there's a lot that can go on in their relationship when the baby comes. Very, very interesting. And I guess talking about the the myths, I want to ask you something that I, I, I've only heard about and I would love to get your take on whether there's truth to that. So is there any aspect of postpartum depression where the mom 
at least hormonally feels like she's lost a part of herself because she's been carrying this baby, feeding this baby, nurturing this baby within her. And now, yes, the baby's alive and that was the point and the goal and this is so beautiful. But she did lose a part of herself in that process. Is that a factor or is that just a pure myth? Oh, absolutely, it's a factor. It's an identity crisis, really, that happens. So, you know, along with everything else we're talking about, all these changes to her body, to her um, psychosocial self, she's having an identity crisis often. You know, who am I? I used to be this person and now I'm this person. Right. And a lot of loss, right? right? Um, loss of freedom, loss of spontaneity, loss of right. uh, the ability to do what you want when you want, how you wanted it. And that may have been your lifestyle for a long time. Right, right. That lifestyle's gone. So wow. yeah, women have a, a major identity crisis can happen around it. And it also, an, another factor is how their mothers or their parents see the role of motherhood. Mm -hmm. So if a mother, a new mom has an adult mother whose life was completely focused on her children. That may be the expectation now of her adult daughter who's become a mother. And there's a lot of, um, you know, discord in that when the new mother says, well, I want to, I'm going to take maternity leave and go back to work and I'm going to take my baby to daycare. Well, her adult mother may not approve of that. And, that gets conveyed, whether directly or indirectly. Right, so. right. Or even indirectly, we instinctively fall back to that as our model, even yeah. if it wasn't the best one. Right. And a lot of that contributes to the identity crisis. Am I doing the wrong thing if I leave my baby? Should I quit my job and stay home with my baby? Am I a bad mother? Right. The question of am I a bad mother? And what makes me a good mother is pretty um, central to everything we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it can also be fathers because fathers come into this transition having an identity crisis of their own. That's right. And part of that is what makes a good father. But part of that is what is their expectation of their partner? Is their expectation of their partner to be the way their mother was? Right. Right. Well, my mother you know, she quit her job and she stayed home and baked cookies and did this for me. You're not going to do that now. That's right. So. Right. I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, just for a moment. In your opinion, should we not hype up how glorious and magical the experience of birth is, given the fact that it could lead to a letdown and it could lead to feelings of this didn't match up with what I envisioned. So in a proactive, preventative measure to really protect, is that something that we would you recommend based on that? Yes. We don't do a service to parents by only emphasizing the light. There is a lot of joy in having a baby. Absolutely. And I say that to my clients all the time. Look at your baby. Look at your baby. Your baby is smiling. Your baby is looking at you. Your baby is cooing and growing and thriving. And, and all of these wonderful things have come into your life. And all these opportunities, there are. your life has completely changed. But are you not sleeping? Yes. Are you not able to concentrate, focus, do the things you used to do? Yes. So we really should do a better job at preparing people yeah. for the transition. And that would and I, actually make them less less alone if they knew that they were normal uh, and that this wasn't unique or different. Absolutely. But, you know, I, you asked my opinion. I think this applies to most things in our society now. We really have gotten away from preparing people for the reality of the way things, life is. It's not always easy. It, we need to emphasize the light and the dark. That's right. That's right, with our, our obsession for to paint things as rosy and upbeat, optimistic and positive, we're actually sometimes doing ourselves a disservice by creating a ill-prepared generation to deal and cope and to experience some of the curveballs that are inevitable. Well, it's funny that you would say that because I find 
that as I see more and more millennials in my practice, there is a real expectation to have things go well quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of across the board. It's not just with having a baby. It's in general, with a lot of things in life. Yeah. Instant gratification, yes. a lack of organic progress. And that's probably just going to make the numbers of people struggling with postpartum depression go up because the more entitled or the more they expect it to be a smooth, seamless process, the bigger the letdown will be when it's not like that. Yeah. And that is actually a lot of what I do in my practice is a lot of parenting, reparenting, and a lot of parent education. You know, it's okay to let your child, you know, cry. It's okay for your baby to cry. It's okay to make, you know, parents don't want to let their children experience pain or displeasure, you know, and, um, and they take it personally, right? So they're internalizing, I must be a bad mother because my baby's crying and I can't soothe my baby. The two things that make a mother feel adequate and have mother self-esteem right off the bat are being able to feed and soothe her baby. Yes. And the other thing we haven't really talked about is the feeding aspect. So breastfeeding particularly is also um, something that women feel expect they should be able to do right away. And our society puts a lot of emphasis on you should breastfeed. There's a lot of shoulds around it nowadays. And if she can't do that, which many women can't, it's not something that's natural. It's a learned skill um, for her and the baby. Then she feels inadequate. And then she feels like she's failed. Right. You know, it's amazing because there are not a lot of areas in behavioral health where simply informing and transmitting the objective information prior to the event has the actual capability to reduce the acuity and the severity of the event. And this is one of them. I mean, preventative sort of education can really alleviate the loneliness and just, you know, this is a part of the process. We should be teaching high school and college students what it may be like when they want to partner with someone and raise a family. That's right. Could you elaborate on the attachment issues piece a little bit more? I mean, we didn't, you, in, you know, as far as the relationship between the mother and the baby and what postpartum depression can do and how that plays into attachment issues, what's a, what's, what's a little color on that? Well, depending on how you're attached is going to affect how you attach to your baby. So, mm -hmm. for, you know, if a, a mother is very securely attached in her own relationships, she's probably going to have a, a secure attachment with her child. Mm -hmm. If she received a very insecure attachment or avoidant attachment from her caregivers, she's probably going to transfer that in, onto her child and, and not form a very solid attachment, right? Um, we see it all the time where women who really didn't have a very good attachment to their own parents are kind of avoiding their babies, don't really want to get close, there's intimacy issues, right? And then the baby kind of gets, hmm, right. distant. How do you uh, break the cycle? You heal the attachment. You work in psychotherapy, you, mm -hmm. you, just like you do with postpartum depression, you do all the things that you would want to do. Teach them how to be, have a solid attachment with another person. Right that the one that they have with their baby doesn't have to be the one that they had with their own parent. And I'd say with fathers too, there's so many people who go through the world with, you know, fathers who are, they're very detached from. And a lot of those fathers were very avoidantly attached. Right. Right. That's so interesting. If you yeah, can give a, a brief sort of, uh, recommendation and guidance to fathers, to husbands, uh, how to be the best husband you can be, the best father you can be with a spouse who's struggling with postpartum depression. What would that advice look like? You know, <laughs> it would be the same as I would give to all men. Yes. Um, that it, it serves men, their partners, whether they be men or women, 
and their children to become vulnerable and to look inward, to become self-reflective and not be afraid of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, several therapists who all, around the country and here in Los Angeles who specialize in working with men during the postpartum time. Men in our country or in our country, in our world, are socialized to not feel and to be strong, not weak, feeling is weak, to go out and slay saber-toothed tigers and then come back to the cave. And what that does is it creates a disconnect with those people they've left behind in the cave. Right. right? right. You know, their partner and their children. So I think men really would do well with getting more in touch with their feelings and being able to communicate those with their partners. Hmm. That's amazing. I mean, we definitely see the, the, the macho masculine uh, sort of Im image, you know, being uh, when it's blown out of proportion, it could lead to a lot of insensitivity and it could be perceived as, uh, as being apathetic. Meanwhile, he's only doing that because he can't cope with this. He doesn't know how to respond and he doesn't know how to be supportive. And that's like a little bit of a vicious cycle as well. And it, it could also be like it's it would you know, personalizing this whole thing and the man feeling like somehow she doesn't like him anymore and he's not making her happy and he's not being that, you know, rock of support that she used to lean on. So we really do teach them to not communicate, right. to not feel, to not express. And then their wives show up in my office and say, well, you know, he never talks to me. Well, <laughs> right. Yeah. And I feel so the, alone in this. Yeah, I know. There's the there's the the old uh, story about the couple who come to get a divorce after 27 years. And the judge says, "What is it?" And she says, "Well, we're married 27 years, and he hasn't told me I love you even once." And the judge looks at the man and he says, "Is that for real? You haven't told her I love you even once?" Mm -hmm. He says, "Well, uh, Your Honor, you should know it's not exactly the way she's saying it, of course." On the night of our wedding, 27 years ago, I told her that I love you, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. So that you know that That's being great, yeah, That's being great. super communicative is not exactly the strong in that in that department of, of emotions and feelings is not exactly the strongest masculine trait. I, I want to uh, traverse for a second as far as the interventions go. I know that there's a lot of new cutting edge treatment for depression. Some, some of these modalities we utilize um, in our behavioral health facilities like TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and ketamine. Mm -hmm. Would you be open to your clients um, utilizing that? I mean, what, is that something that you see effective for perinatal and postpartum as well? Absolutely. The, the psychiatrist I work with all the time who specializes in TMS, and I, I have referred people to him. You know, it's hard to get people to go to a psychiatrist anyways, is because stigma still <laughs> is plays such a part in it. Um, but I will do a real sales pitch on why we need medical intervention um, for our brain. The brain's an organ of the body. Yeah. And just going and talking to a psychiatrist to get an evaluation and to get information, but to not necessarily take steps to do anything. You don't need to be seeking treatment. You just need to be seeking information. Um, and I do that a lot because there's so much misinformation out there and so much stigma around psychiatric treatment. Right. And it's so misplaced. It's so misplaced. The same way nobody thinks twice about getting treatment for, for, for medical issues, a hand, a leg, an ear, a nose infection. I mean, what's right. that the brain is, is another one of those organs because I guess people don't necessarily uh, consciously see the connection between medical and behavioral health, between the brain and your psychological state and your, your emotional reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to your point, we're, we've advanced so much and yet we still have so far to go. Yes, yes. And that leads me to my final question. You know, if you can magically make a change in how perinatal mental health is treated or postpartum depression, a societal change, a legislative change. I mean, w would you like to see things very different in the future or do you think we're on the right course and that treatment is, is, is very effective and that, you know, we, we're tackling this issue comprehensively? 
I think we're doing a good job. I think we've made a lot of progress. I think we, you know, depression is still the number one complication of pregnancy, not diabetes, but right. we, we test for gestational diabetes during pregnancy. I think I would like to see every woman assessed for depression during pregnancy. I think that, and, and then provided with treatment options. We get diagnosed with cancer and we immediately get a referral to an oncologist, right? Right. We don't test and assess and test for depression during pregnancy. And we know that 15% of the population who's pregnant is going to be depressed postpartum. Right. So why don't we test them, assess them, and provide them with healthcare providers? Here's a reproductive psychiatrist. Here's a reproductive therapist. And in that first six to eight weeks postpartum, you might want to give these people a call. Here's that, a support group that, that you can go yeah. to. No, that makes so much sense because then when they go through the symptoms, they know they're not alone. They know this is normal and they have somebody to guide them through this in a professional authoritative way. That is Correct. very, very powerful. Wow. Yeah. So that's what I'd like to see changed. I would like to not call an OBGYN with uh, a depressive woman in, who's just left my office and say, you know what, she's two weeks postpartum, she's suicidal, and have the OB say to me, you know, asking me to treat her postpartum depression is like me asking you to treat an ovarian cyst. And I've had that happen. Wow. That's yeah. a that's a very compartmentalized way of treating treating women. Yeah. And yeah. that's what we need to get away from. Yeah. And I get that, you know, when you're an OB and somebody gets diagnosed with cancer, you don't treat them, you refer them out. But the right. same should happen with postpartum depression. You know, I recognize that I'm the medical doctor on this case and I'm gonna give them resources and refer them to where they need to go to get the treatment they need. Amen to that. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with us, Kathy. It was really You're great welcome. to talk to you. And thank You're you for welcome. joining us on The nice Discovery talk with you. Nady. Thank you. And how could people find out more about the work that you do and your practice? I would suggest that anybody who's interested in postpartum depression and perinatal mood disorders during pregnancy, go to postpartum.net. They don't need to come to me. They need to go to postpartum.net, which is Postpartum Support International's website. And the if you're in Los Angeles, the place to go is Maternal Mental Health Now. Mm -hmm. If you just type in Maternal Mental Health Los Angeles, you'll get to it. And we have resources for uh, therapists, psychiatrists. We have um, pelvic floor people. We have acupuncture, fertility people. OBs, psychologists, everything. And you can find it all there. And you can also find information about symptoms, treatment. And you can also find people who've posted about their experiences so you don't feel so alone. Wow. We have support groups listed on that website. So lots and lots of resources. That is amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. We started a task force in LA County about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, it was called the mater the maternal mental health task force. Mm -hmm. And we it is now called maternal mental health now and we are out training and and treating and trying people all over the city in the county trying to do exactly what we've been talking about today. Wow, that's extraordinary. God bless you. That's a really beautiful thing for so yeah. many. I want to also thank our audience for joining us too. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Discover You as much as I did. At Montier, we want you to know that you are not alone on your journey. And to find out more about our innovative treatment programs, you can find us at MontierBH.com. And you can listen to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Wishing you all vibrant health, a safe and peaceful day. See you next time.